to our feet. So glad that you made it to the house of God. Good afternoon, church. And so before we start, if we could just lift up our voices right now to him. Holy Spirit, we come before you and we thank you, Lord, for all that you are doing, God. I pray, Lord, that you would move in this place, God. Lord, that you would have your way, oh God, as we lift up our voices to you, Lord. You are victorious, oh God.
on, can you declare this out and say, who has redeemed my, my soul? Oh, praise the world, who has authority?
ahead, church, and sing it out. Together we say, Hallelujah. You inhabit the presence of your people. You inhabit the praises of your people. Come on, it's a simple Hallelujah. Thing when we say that he inhabits the praises of his people, that he abides in that place, that he becomes present. There's sometimes when he sits above, but it happens that there's a shift when you begin to praise him and lift up an offering of sacrifice and praise and adoration to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He begins to walk among us. He begins to walk in between our praises because he delights in your worship. He delights in your praise. So right now as you worship, how would you worship if your king was standing right in front of you? How would you worship? Would you lift your hands? Would you sing? Would you cry? Would you prostrate before the Father? Say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. to worship yes we were created to worship you with every breath in my lungs I'll say to you all the days of my life that you deserve the praise you deserve all the worship I'll pour out my oil upon the master You deserve it all, you deserve it all. Cause you're worthy of it all. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, you're worthy of it all. And far from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Can you help me sing? You are worthy of it all. And you're worthy of it all. And far from you are all things. And to you are all things. every hand lifted in this place and let's declare together you are worthy of it all you are worthy of it all for from you Put your hands together for the Lord. If you know that he's worthy, if he's deserving of your praise, how much more would you pour out your worship if he was standing right in front of you? God, we thank you that we do not need another reason to praise. We have the breath in our lungs, the life that you have given us. So God, we offer up our worship to you. 
We don't need another reason to cry out. We don't need another reason to glorify your name. So church, as we sing out this next song, I need you to lift up your worship to heaven. We thank you, Lord.
see you move, sing it out. I'll still praise you, even after all that I've been through. Sing, I'll still praise you, I know every promise. And there is nothing that you have to prove, cause I will bless you. Bless your name. Your praise will forever be on our lips, God. God, we love this song because it just declares the truth. It doesn't matter if you do another thing for us. All the goodness and your hand over our lives through every time, every season. You've kept us here. You kept us alive, God. So with the very breath in our lungs, God, we worship you and we thank you. You don't have to prove another thing to us, God, because you've been so good so good faithful you have been we thank you for your unending love your steadfast love for us we your church we as your body we say to you be the glory to you be all the honor to you be all the praise in jesus mighty name your church says amen and amen come on clap it up to the lord welcome to our third service can you take a moment and greet your neighbor and tell them they look good? Their worship is inspiring and they look anointed. Right after this, you may take a seat and take a look at this video. Whatever happened to predictability? The milkman, the paper boy, evening TV. Did I get delivered here? Somebody tell me, please. This whole world confusing me. Clouds as mean as you ever see. And the bird knows your truth. Then a little voice inside you whispers. thankful that we do not have to serve alone on Sundays. Can we give it up for our serve team? Woo! I'm Josh. I'm Eden. And we have your announcements for this week. God bless you guys. Again, thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time here, we want to thank you so much. You are a VIP. So after service, make sure you visit our lobby to our VIP room for a gift. Our next announcement is for all of our entrepreneurs and community leaders. April 7th from 5 to 7, we are having a networking event just for you. 
Our goal is to build an in-house directory accessible by all new lifers, listing all available resources. So registration is open up on our website. Where are my ladies at? We are so excited to be honoring Radiant Women. Come join us on May 4th at Elmcrest Banquets. Registration is available on our website. It's $40, and to all my young Radiant Women from 13 to 18, it's only $10 for you. Hope to see you there. He takes them to a town. He leaves the house of bread. He leaves the place where God is trying to chastise his people, and he decides to run. Can I just tell you something? Stay put. When God is trying to shape you and mold you, it's not the time to run. It's the time to say, God, I submit to your will. I may be facing hard times right now. There may be a famine in my family, but I will not run. Jumpstart season is around the corner. For those of you that don't know, Jumpstart is our Pastors and Leaders Conference where people from all around the world come in to learn from us. So join us for that week as we start with our benefit concert with Miel San Marcos. We are so excited to have them alongside with free worship. You can purchase your ticket for $40 on our website. It's Wednesday night, so you don't want to miss out. Then, leading into our Thursday and Friday sessions, join us for $25 for new lifers only. Make sure you register in our lobby for your tickets. And our final announcement is... No, no Netflix, Netflix Wednesday! We're so excited to be back this Wednesday. Make sure you join us as we dive deeper into the Word of the Lord. And don't forget your kids, grades first through fifth. They also have Bible study. We also have our Spanish Bible study as well, which you do not want to miss. If you have any questions about these announcements, make sure you visit us online. And these are your weekly announcements. See you next week. Bye! God bless you, New Life. How many excited to be in the house of the Lord this afternoon? Welcome to New Life Covenant, our third service. Number three. Welcome to this crazy church. Amen. And after welcome is thank you. We won't do this all the time, but you, third service, you're the pioneers. You might not know this, but you're a testament to what God is doing is here, doing here. Third service is not something that we wanted to do. Third service is something that we had to do because the church is growing. God is God, to God be the glory, is doing exciting things here. And the mantle of evangelism and discipleship, the mantle of missionary work is going to be put on you. You're going to grow to third service. So we're grateful. We're grateful that you come. Welcome to the family. Amen. And we, like you, have an anticipation, an expectation of the great things that God is going to do. Amen? We're grateful for the gifts. We're grateful for the anointing. We celebrate, you and I, we, we celebrate the greatness of our God. And then there are times in the life of the individual members that God does, goes above and beyond. And those gifts are manifest. And I, I learned from Pastor Ephraim not to say that you're proud, but rather to say that you're grateful. And we're grateful for the great things that God is doing in the individual lives of our Humble Park campus people. And with that in mind, I want to bring up one of our very own Pastor Keys, who has written a book, The Epitome of Greatness. He's going to share. Amen. Praise God, Pastor. Thank you so much. Well, recently, family, my team and I just launched my second book entitled The Epitome of Greatness. In short, The Epitome of Greatness, thank you so much. The Epitome of Greatness is actually a guiding light to the believer to help them to successfully travel down the road of destiny and purpose. I also believe that this book will help you to navigate through the rugged terrains of life and to teach you how to successfully obtain greatness through God's point of view. I want you to grab this book after service is over. I'll be right there in the lobby signing. Stop by. Appreciate you. Amen. He wants you to grab the book after you pay for it. How many would say Mr. Keys would say yeah. amen. Yeah, amen, amen, <laughs> amen, the Lord. amen again. Thank you so much, family. Appreciate amen. you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Beloved, we're going to collect offering in just a few minutes here. 
Amen. Amen. The rich man over here to my left. Amen. But we need to pause. We are a church on the move to the glory of God. Remember, Jesus said, follow me. That's a movement reference. And then when he left, he said, therefore, go. So we're on the move. We don't want to stop, but we do have to pause. And beloved, in light of the news that we heard, the attack, the missile attack against Israel last night, we felt that we need to pause. And we need to, we need to talk about it. We need to talk about it. Beloved, perhaps you think that what's happening in Israel is geographic or political or religious. It is not those things. It is, great. it is bigger than all those things. What's happening in Israel is prophetic. It's a God thing. This is what the Bible calls labor pains, signs that the Lord is coming soon. And we should pause. And we should take an account of what's, we cannot be oblivious when these godly things are happening in the spiritual realms and in the physical realm. We need to take notice, beloved, this is an ark. And everywhere that you see an empty seat is an opportunity for you to invite someone into the ark. And if ever there was a time that we should do everything within our power to love on somebody enough to tell them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that Jesus is coming soon. Some of this information will scare people, but not these people. Because the Bible says we are not of those who shrink back. And are destroyed by we are those of faith and are saved. We are those. Of, so we have to stop. We have to pause and take notice of what's going on. This is a time for you and I to get our houses in order. What's happening in the Middle East is an act of grace. Israel is the apple of God's eye. And God, the Bible says, to pray for the peace of Israel. Here's what I mean about grace. You and I have been given a little more time. Call someone you love. Call someone who is estranged from the Lord. And let them invite them to return. Invite them to come back to church. To come back to the Lord. Pay attention, beloved, to what's going on. My final thing on this, this morning I had other plans, all right? We do other things. I had other plans, and I changed my plans. I got a hold of my sons-in-law, who are the heads of their respective homes, my daughters, my grandchildren, and I encourage them as the head of the, home, as the, head of the family, hey, here's what's going on. Make sure that you go to church. Make sure that you talk to your wife. Make sure that you talk to your children and explain to them what is going on how important it is. Amen? Amen. Beloved, we're going to collect our offering. I want to share the scripture with you. It's from the book of Matthew chapter 6 verses 19 to 21. Familiar scripture, but I want to key on a piece of it. It says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin destroy do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal for where your treasure is there your heart will be also Matthew 6 19 to 21 that last piece where your treasure is beloved when we give to the Lord tithing offering next level pledge it should be from our treasure I, I want it to cost me something when I give to the Lord. The Bible says about King David, they tried to give him a plot of land. They tried to give it to him. And ultimately, that plot of land was going to become the space where the temple was built. And David said, and I'm paraphrasing, I'll stay true to the spirit of what he says, I will not offer to the Lord something that costs me nothing. Understand this about our treasure, where our heart is. If it's true about us, it's also true about God. And everything that we have was first a treasure to the Lord. And as Jehovah Jireh, he released it to us. So we consider it a great grace, a great privilege to be able to come back and bring our treasures to the storehouse. How many would say amen? Beloved, I'm going to ask if you would please stand. We'll pray for the offering and we'll pray 
and the peace of Israel. Father, we come before you now. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise. We acknowledge you as Jehovah, Lord of all. And Lord, we intercede as you taught us to in your word for the peace of the apple of your eye, the nation of Israel. Thank you, Lord, for how you prote have protected them and how you will protect them. Lord, we appeal to you as the Prince of Peace to establish a peace that is beyond all understanding. And we pray, Lord, that you would endow the leaders, the world leaders, with wisdom, knowledge, discernment, and revelation. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done. With regards to offering, Lord, this treasure was first your treasure. You released it to us, and we're grateful. We're grateful to bring it back. Receive it, Lord, in the spirit of worship, in the spirit of, offer, of obedience, and of sacrifice. Bless the nations with it. In Jesus' name, amen.
This song was written by Free Worship. It is an original. They are working on their album. Come on, you can do a better job than that. Clap your hands as we honor the gift that is in this house. And they're going to be releasing, releasing a new album soon. So let's continue to pray with them. Hey, New Life, can you do me a favor? It's not easy to be here from 6.30 in the morning to this time. Would you clap your hands for all the volunteers that serve here on a Sunday? Come on. Thank you to all the volunteers. We're so grateful. We're so grateful for you and excited for what God has in store. Uh, this is your first time here at New Life Covenant. My name is David, pastor of this church, and we're glad that you are in the house. And uh, right after service, we'll love to meet and greet you. There's a tent that is placed in the lobby, and I will be there. And uh, if you've never met me, I would love to to meet you before you enjoy this beautiful 80 degree weather come on now Jesus is good he is smiling down in Chicago today and we will receive it so uh, how many are ready for the word of God here this afternoon Philippians chapter 1 I'm going to read verses 12 through 14 Philippians chapter 1 12 through 14 for those that are watching online glad that you are tuning in we encourage you that uh, come to the church. If you are able to come, make it, come here. We've got three services on Sunday mornings. Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 14. We're on a sermon series that is called The Paradox of Joy. And uh, we're going to continue reading on the Philippian church. And uh, this is Paul that is writing a letter. And I want you to know that as Paul is writing a letter, he is in prison and he's encouraging a church that he has lifted up with these very words. And this is what he says. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. I want you to go ahead and repeat after me. Your word is written in my mind. Your word is hidden in my heart. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light for my path. I will seek you with all my strength i choose to live my life according to your word your word O oh lord is eternal you may be seated we started off strong and then you guys started fading out little by little towards the end so we're going to get better at that as we do this every week i'm going to speak to you today about joy in the journey how can we have joy in the journey and when I speak of journey I'm talking about life and you all know that in life there are many ups and downs the paradox of joy let me just give you a little recap on what we talked about last week as it's going to flow and connect into what I'm going to share with you today a paradox is a statement that goes against common sense but still true so logically how can I wrestle with the reality of me grieving but yet having peace that that is the paradox of joy the question that is asked is can I have joy in suffering and the and the answer to that is yes you can have joy in suffering now joy is internal which is not dependent on the external whatever is external is what provides us to be happy uh, so when I buy you a birthday gift, it's going to put a smile on your face. It's going to make you happy. Whenever I do a kind, uh, when I, whenever I do a, any type of act of kindness towards you, it's, it's going to bring a happiness. But the thing about happiness is that it is circumstantial. Uh, it is momentarily. It, it can last for a little while, uh, but eventually that's going to get old. And in order for you to maintain happy, then you need something else to happen for you to produce happiness with well, joy is on the total different spectrum joy is internal now the source of our joy is a package deal that is embodied by Jesus so so, so God is the source 
of our joy. And when we're talking about it being internal, what that means is that whatever's happening externally does not mean that it needs to manifest internally. We may still feel it. We, 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 we still have the impact of, of the emotions, but it is not dictating our movement. We, 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 are, we are people of faith, and people of faith operate trusting in God. And as Christians, we trust that God is going to give us joy. Now, one of the characteristics of a Christian as we grow and mature is joy. Joy does have to be learned. There has to be a separation and understanding of the difference between joy and happiness. Joy is one of the nine fruits of the Spirit that Paul shares in his letter to the Galatians. If you ever want to measure your growth as a Christian or even your maturity as a Christian, Galatians 5, and 23 would give you a good indication of where you stand. And the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. The fruit of the Spirit is not broken up into nine different fruits. If you pay close attention to the Scripture itself, the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit, which is singular, not plural. So the fruit of the Spirit comes along with nine different characteristics. And the nine characteristics is sliced up within one fruit. Which means that when you come to a place of salvation, you are filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. And God that is the God of I am, that, is, that embodies the fruit of the Spirit, that is the characteristics of God, now manifests into your heart. It becomes your character. Now a lot of this does have to be practiced because... You know that through maturity, you don't think the way that you used to think. Through life experiences, you, you, you don't do the things that you used to do because you have grown up and you have matured. As a Christian, as you continue to dive into the things of God, you will mature. You will learn how to practice more self-control. You, you will learn how to be more disciplined. You would learn how to, be, how to have joy. Now, now the th good thing about, uh, about the fruit of the Spirit, because it is one, then we can benefit from multiple characteristics and it will produce. For instance, let me give you an example. Joy plus peace equals tranquility, which is the fruit of God. So I can have not just one characteristic, I can have multiple characteristics that produce produces fruit well let me give you another example joy plus kindness plus gentleness equals tenderness this is the fruit of God I can lean on multiple fruit multiple characteristics within the fruit to be able to produce what I need in the season of my life the reason that it says fruit is because it is one the reason it says spirit is because it's one you and I, when we are in Christ, we are one. The moment that my wife and I decided to go into a covenant relationship and we made our, and we made our uh, marriage vows, we are two different identities. We are two different people, but we are one. The same way it is, it is with you in Christ. That the moment you say yes to Jesus, though he's God and you are his son, you are one. So when God is in you, then what God embodies, he also empowers you with. The fruit of the Spirit is the fruit of God. It is God that manifests it. And joy is a character of God given to us by him for what? For the external. It is for the external to combat whatever you're facing on the outside. Whatever you're facing in what we call life. I want you to know that when we talk about journey, we're talking about life. Anytime you and I go on a journey, we, we, we have a book bag or we have a suitcase. And we always pack what is essential. Joy is essential. No matter where you go, you got to carry the fruit of the Spirit. 
No matter what you do, no matter what type of conversations you have, it's like the Visa card. You can't leave home without it. You, or is it MasterCard? Which one is it? You guys know what I'm saying. It's the fruit of the Spirit is constantly with us because it is the God that is in us. And it's not like we leave God home when we're on the street. Wherever we go, we need God to be with us. Whatever we do, whatever conversations we have, that's why if, you got, if, if, if you've got an interview that is coming up, take God with you. This is why if you have an important conversation you need to have, take God with you. This is why if you have important decisions that you need to make, take God with you. Because God would manifest himself and give you what we call supernatural. It goes above your logic. It, it goes above your strength. If I am weakened, I need God to give me strength. Supernatural type of strength. When I got to make a decision, then I need wisdom. I don't need earthly wisdom. I need wisdom that comes from the throne of God. So I need him to speak into my soul so that I can divide one from the other. If I need to be a parent, I need to be a godly parent that is full of the Holy Spirit. Because there are some decisions that I'm going to make for one child that I cannot make for the other child. I I need wisdom from God and some experiences is not going to give me the wisdom that I need the wisdom that I need is only going to come from the one that is capable of giving it to me it is the source he here's what I want you to know is that God is committed to our joy he is committed to your joy which is why we have to expand our thoughts about joy to more than what is superficial. L listen, I, I can make you happy with superficial stuff. How many of us have ever been happy with superficial stuff? I have. I've gotten raises before. Man, that made me happy. But when inflation happened, <laughs> you guys understand what I'm saying? It made me, when I bought a new car, that made me happy. And then when the first payment came, I'm like, yeah. Right? These superficial stuff, ain't nothing wrong with that. Ain't nothing wrong with, with all of the, uh, the external stuff that we can experience. But we got to expand ourselves in understanding joy in a more deeper level. In this life, we will experience different types of affliction. You will experience affliction. And in this life, God has made promises for you to take hold of. I want you to know here today is that you can find joy in the journey. Because you know that in the journey of life that there is many ups and down. You know that in the life that we live here on earth there are many moments that we will celebrate and there are other moments where we will mourn. We have different types of experiences. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul, who is now writing to another church, the Thessalonian church, he says, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word, listen to this, in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So the word that was given to you, was given to you that combated your afflictions. And because you were filled with the Holy Spirit, despite of the fact you were afflicted, you had joy. He is acknowledging a church that was responding in a way that he recognized the fruit of their faith. I want you to know that when you are responding with the fruit of your faith, which is in Christ Jesus, then what's in you would eventually come out of you. Joy would come out of you and combat whatever suffering you may have. Which is why Jesus on the mount, the greatest sermon that was ever preached, said, Blessed is the one who mourns, for they will be comforted. When you look at that scripture from the front end, it is an oxymoron type of statement. How can I be blessed if I'm mourning? But the truth is, is that there is healing when you do it healthy. And God says, I would comfort you. So the blessing comes when you lean on me and I allow you to now be comforted by my grace. There is a blessing when you are afflicted. God is more than superficial. 
And sometimes our prayer are so super, superficial that what we're asking for is our things that eventually would not last forever. We are asking for jobs and we are asking for children and we're asking for family and we're asking for increase. And God is saying there's so much more to life than what you're asking for. Some of us need to ask for grace in affliction. Some of us need to ask for strength in weakness. Because these are the very elements that God says I can give you if you just ask for it. God is more than superficial, superficial. And if you're taking notes, God is the hope that empowers joy in affliction. Joy in affliction. Paul again is writing to a new church of believers in Thessalonians that even in their own afflictions, they endured with the joy of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the scripture is not clear on what type of afflictions... They were facing, but whatever journey they were on, God was the source of their joy. The question that we need to ask ourselves is, is God the source of our joy? We're not, not sure what type of afflictions you are going through today, but upon salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit. Some of us need to activate the God that is in us. Uh, some of us have to tap into the God that we serve. Some of us forgot who God is. Must, must I remind you that God is the creator of heaven and earth? M must I remind you that God is limitless? Must I remind you that, that God is infinite? What must I remind you that God holds the whole world in his hands? The psalm speaks about God and the massiveness of who he is. That even the rivers are like the lines that are in the palms of our hands. God is so big. He is so powerful that no one and nothing can ever come against him. Remind yourself today who you serve. Remind yourself today the God that you have surrendered to. Because if you surrender to the God of heaven and earth, then he would activate the power and manifest it towards your afflictions. The paradox of joy. The paradox of joy. God is in you. It doesn't always make logical sense. But God is in you. If God is in you and the God is the source of your joy. Then I would tell you this. Joy is there for your affliction. And joy is there for your suffering. And joy is there for your pain. God in you doesn't possess you. Do you know that? God in you doesn't control you. He doesn't manipulate you. God influences you and God empowers you. That's the God that we serve. The word empower means this, to give the power and the authority to do something. In affliction, God is on the move and gives the power and authority to have joy. You should feel the right to have joy. Because some of us feel like we don't deserve joy. I'm here to tell you, you deserve joy. And you should embrace joy. And you should walk with joy. And you should live with joy. This journey I'm on, no matter how difficult it is, I am determined that it is not wasted. This journey that I'm on, whatever afflictions that I'm facing in my life, I am determined that I am not going to waste it, but I'm going to use it for the glory of God. I may be suffering today, but I'm going to turn this suffering into a testimony. I want people to know that in the midst of my afflictions, I'm still going to praise God. If you ever want to confuse the enemy, listen to me now. If you ever want to confuse the enemy, praise God in the middle of your storm. If you ever want to confuse the enemy, then lift a shout of praise before your God. And the enemy don't know what to do with that. Because he thought that that sickness was going to kill you. He thought that depression was going to kill you. He thought that divorce was going to kill you. He thought that addiction was going to kill you. He thought that whatever you were facing in your life was going to kill you. But there you go in the middle of your sickness, lifting 
lifting up your hands unto the Lord and saying, God, I still praise you. There you go in the middle of a storm, giving God all the glory and all the praise and saying, God, there is no one that is like you. If you want to confuse the devil, then give a God a praise and a shout and then you will begin to see that the God in you would manifest and empower you. The, 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 the church of Thessalonians learned this hope from, from both the leaders and the Lord. That there are people in your life that you look to to be a prime example. Many of you, you look towards me to be an example. You, you look for guidance. You, you, you look, and when you're looking, Paul is saying, one of the reasons why you are experiencing joy in your affliction is because we, you have been watching us. You have to know, good or bad, that you're an example. And people will mimic you. And people will use you as an example. And I want to be the person that leads people, not astray, into destruction. But I want to be the person who leads people to Christ. The people, the church of Thessalonians, were looking at Paul and the leadership because they were following Christ. The leaders were an example to the people. Paul says this to the Corinthian church. He says this in 11.1. 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. You need to understand he didn't necessarily say follow me. He said follow the what? Example. Paul is not saying follow the person. He's saying, follow the message. Paul is not saying, follow the messenger. He is saying, follow the message. What I'm trying to tell you, the moment that Pastor David stops following the message, you need to run. You don't follow me, you follow the message. When you lead people... When you lead your family, you need to be an example. And our humanistic ideas have to line up with God. And if they don't line up with God, then we best check ourselves. We, we've got to realize that our opinion should never trump God's truth. It doesn't matter what times we live in. I know what times we live in. I understand what the schools and the educational system is trying to teach my children. I understand what the world is trying to endorse and the initiatives that are trying to be pushed. But here's what I do know. That the Bible teaches me that whenever they try to tell you to bow down. If you are not bowing down to God, then you should never bow down. That there was three Hebrew boys by the name of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they built this idol. And they said, listen, anytime you hear the sound of horns, then we want you to bow down and worship this idol. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they heard the sound. Why did they do that? They did that because they did not want anyone to serve God. And God was a threat to everyone. The Bible says that they blew the horns and there goes everybody that bowed down before this statue that was built except three Hebrew boys. They stood up while everybody was bowing down. They stood out while everybody went with the flow. You and I are called to be the salt. You and I are called to be the light. We don't produce the light. We reflect the light. And what God is trying to tell us is that we've got to reflect the truth. Because it is the truth that's going to set people free. He wanted them to imitate him to the extent that he followed Christ. Though Paul wasn't perfect, he was a man that was committed to Jesus. I want you to be committed to Jesus. That you don't just become hearers of his word, that you are now doers of his word. That you would apply your faith into narratives where you can put your trust in him. Not knowing what's going to happen, but believing that God can do it. Because of his faith, he benefited, he benefited from God in trial times. If you are not benefiting 
from God in trial times and you've missed God. You've excluded God. You've dismissed God. You've rejected God. But if you are in a trial time, you have everything that you need to get through what you're going through. Paul in Philippians chapter 1 used his chains, listen to this, as a witness to testify and preach the gospel. To use his chains, I know what I'm going through, but I'm going to use this to glorify God. We can find joy while in chains and still have great impact. You can be suffering and still find joy and have great impact in prison. He could have felt sorry for himself. Have you ever felt sorry for yourself? Woe is me. He, he could have blamed God, yet he encouraged the Philippian church. And this is what he says. What has happened to him, what has happened to me has served to advance the gospel. I don't know why I'm going through what I'm going through. But all I do know is that while I'm in this chain, I'm going to do everything in my power to advance the kingdom of God. I don't know why I'm suffering the way, the reason, or, or, or why I'm suffering the way that I'm suffering. But as long as I'm suffering, I'm going to continue to advance the gospel. Do you know that people are watching you? Because true Christians will be tested when there's affliction. Because you have an opportunity to either praise God in your affliction or deny God. You have an opportunity to testify about God's goodness in your affliction or reject God. People are watching you. It is easy to lift up your hands when you're on the mountaintop. It is easy for you to lift up your hands when everything's going good. When you're healthy, when, when you're financially healthy, when your marriage is healthy. It's easy to praise God when you're cruising. But what happens when you're in affliction? How do you respond when you're in affliction? I'm almost done. Joy, listen to me, comes from the relationship we have in Jesus and the assignment given to advance the gospel. We cannot be Christians that just get saved. We cannot be Christians that just says yes to Jesus but does not advance the kingdom of God. Joy comes from the relationship that we have in Jesus. And can I tell you, and I'm going to talk more about this next week, that we enjoy the assignment that God gives us. It is a great honor to be a pastor. It is a great honor to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a great honor to lead people into salvation. It is a great honor. Your affliction should not be an excuse to stop advancing the gospel. Just because I'm a pastor does not mean that I don't go through some stuff. But I have to be determined not to put my mind on my afflictions more than I do on God. I got to keep my eyes on the prize Paul says this in Romans 5 3 to 5 he says not only that but we rejoice in our suffering knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our heart through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. To rejoice means going back to joy. Some of us have lost our joy and what I'm trying to tell you is go back to joy well how do I go back to joy well if God is the giver and the source of joy what I'm trying to tell you is just go back to Jesus you're trying to go through life and all of your afflictions by yourself you're trying to do it merely with your own strength you're trying to do it merely with your own power but God is supernatural and would give you the grace to endure your afflictions I know what our prayers are God remove this from me do you understand that most times God is not going to remove it from us? Do you understand that if you're broke right now, then you're going to walk out of this place broke? Do you understand that whatever drama you got going on, that when you walk out of this place, that drama is awaiting you? Just because you said yes to Jesus does not mean that your troubles are going to leave you. What God promises, I'm going to give you joy in, the, in your afflictions. What God promises you is that in your joy, there is hope. And in your hope, there is endurance. You're going to endure. 
endure what you're going through. You may feel like you're about to break, but God says, I'm going to give you strength. Why? Because joy is going to get you through. Rejoice is a repeated pattern of going back to the previous state of joy. Paul in chains is going back to the previous state and he is saying, while I'm in prison, I have an assignment. Just because you're going through a thing does not mean that you have to stop advancing the kingdom. Just because you're suffering does not mean that you got to stop preaching the gospel. We are living in a generation where people, when they're troubled, they just stop. And I don't know what's going on with humans and people where we have become so weak. Where God has now become secondary and third and fourth in our life. And God is saying, I have saved you from your iniquities. I have given you so much to live for. I have given you strength in your weakness. All I want you to do is pay that thing forward. There is an assignment that is on your life and you got to stop sitting on your assignment. Here is the facts, y'all. There are people that are dying and going to hell by the day. And you have the greatest message in the world that can become the lifesaver in their life. So why allow the gospel of Jesus Christ be shut up in your bones when you have the answer? We have an assignment. God is not asking for you and I to sit on it. We are one body. We are united as one in Christ Jesus. And there are a lot of hurting people that need our anointing. You know that anointing In the Old Testament, oil was used for anointing. When a king will be blessed for the position, they will put oil on them. And they would anoint them. And what that symbolized was that the blessing is going to go with you. And the blessing is going to be ahead of you. Anointing. But you cannot produce oil without the crushing of olives oil comes from the crushing of olives when you are afflicted you are being crushed but that is the greatest time for you to produce oil when you are in troubled times you are being pressed from every side but the greatest time for you to produce the anointing that God has for you is when you're being pressed because you're going to come from a place that is real you're going to come from a place where you have to completely depend on God and his strength. You're not just talking from one side of your mouth. But you understand that what I am going through, God has given it to me. And if God has done it for me, then God can do it for you. There is an anointing that is on your life. And there are too many Christians that are sitting on the sidelines. There are too many Christians that are cheerleaders. There are too many Christians that are on the stands and God is saying, I need you to step out from being on the stands. I need you to stop being a fan. And I need you to start participating and get on the field. Because as I told you last week, God has called you and I to be missionaries. He has called us to be evangelists. We are living in a dying world. A sickened world. Where four-year-old boys are getting shot in Humble Park. We are living in a sick world. Where teenagers are stealing cars and committing crimes. We are living in a world where the blood that is being spilled on our streets are crying out. And the same way that God looked at Abel and said, where is your brother? He looked at Cain and he said, where is your brother? His blood is crying out from the ground. The blood is being cried out to the ground. And there we go. And we're on vacation mode as Christians. Where are the prophets? Where are the priests? Where are the ambassadors? Where are those that are going to use their gifts for the glory of God? Where are those that are going to be zealous for Jesus and say, I'm sick and tired of seeing people lost in this world. If I can be a part, 
then I want to be a part. And God is looking upon the church of Jesus Christ and saying, are you willing to partner with me? Are you willing to partner with me? Because watch this, because we are one. Are we willing as an assignment to advance the kingdom with no excuses, unapologetically tell people about how good Jesus is? Paul, he tells them in my chains, listen, the whole prison cell is being witnessed to. The name of Jesus is being spread like wildfire. People are being saved in the prison. Not only that, this is what he says, Paul says, but all my brothers and sisters that are not in prison, the Galatian church, the Thessalonian church, the Philippian church, everybody who hears about what is happening in here, they are building confidence to spread this gospel forward. Because they're looking at their leader and they're saying, man, if my leader is in chains and he is filled with the spirit of God and people are being saved, then I now have a faith that I can carry out to spread the gospel in the place that God has assigned me in. Would you stand to your feet? Pastor D, where, where do I start? Well, you, you first start with God. Because I'm going to give two calls here. And the first call that I want to give is where do we get the source of joy? And we get the source of joy from God himself. And the way that you get the source of joy is when you surrender to God. So I want to give an opportunity for those of you who do not have a relationship with God. And I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about relationship. If you don't have a relationship with God and you're ready to surrender, then today is the day that God will renew your joy. For those of you that are in this room and you're saying, Pastor D, I know about God, but I just run from God. I'm here to tell you, stop running. Jesus is right there waiting for you. Matter of fact, all you got to do is a small pivot, just like the lost son who was on his way back. And when he was on his way back to the home, the father from a distance saw his son. And the Bible says that the father ran to the son. And with every shame and guilt that the son had, the Bible says that the father loved him and hugged him and kissed him and gave him a new robe and gave him new sandals. And he went even as far as putting a signet ring on him, which means the power and the authority that I have is now belongs to you. It is the grace of God. So if you're running, I'm here to tell you, stop running. There's nothing good outside of God. Let me, just, let me just give you a warning right now. There is nothing good outside of God. I know what you've been trying to do. Jumping from relationship to relationship to relationship. Trying to find your love. Trying to find your joy. Trying to find your peace. You will not find it in humans. You will not find it in your work. You will not find it in your finances. But let me tell you where you would find it. You would find it in Jesus. He will fulfill you. He is the bread of life. Life. He is the water to our soul. We will never be thirsty again. This is why we can be on one end in a place of suffering, but on the under on the other end, full of joy. I confess to you, I don't have everything, but I have everything. I don't have everything, and maybe everything that I want superficially. My God, but I have everything that I need. And if you're in this place and you want to be in relationship with Jesus, young people, listen to me. Your mom and your dad cannot make this decision for you. It is up to you. Young person, listen to me. Young adult, listen to me. Adults, listen to me. This decision falls on you and you alone. With every eyes closed and head bowed and you're saying, Pastor D, I want to receive Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If you're watching online, I want to receive the Lord as my Savior. I want him to redeem me. Right where you're at, just lift up your hands and say, Pastor D, that's me. I see your hands lifted. Is there anybody else? I see your hands lifted. I see your hands lifted. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. Would you do me a favor? I'm going to ask for those that lift up their hands. Would you find the courage to get out of your seat? 
not with your head down, but I want you to walk up here with your head up. And I want you to know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Come out of your seat and meet us here at the altar. New life, let's clap our hands. Come on. And encourage those that want to come to know Jesus. Come on. I want to call every prodigal. Come out of your seat. Every prodigal son. Every prodigal daughter. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus loves you. It is the greatest story. But even beyond the story, it is a reality and a truth that His grace, His love will set you free. I'm going to make one more call. These are for people for salvation. Come on, let's pray with them. We're going to lead them at the end with Pastor Rico in a prayer. My second call is for those of you who've been sitting when you know you should be working. There is an assignment. There is a purpose. And there is a calling that is on your life. It looks different for everybody. It doesn't, al it doesn't look always like this with a person that has a mic in their hands. It looks different for everybody. But if you've been sitting on your assignment, advancing the kingdom because you've been in chains, it's not that you don't have faith in Jesus, but you've been more focused about the change than you have about advancing the kingdom. But today the message has spoken into your heart and you're saying, Pastor, I am ready to take on the assignment that despite of the season that I find myself in, I am ready to walk into my calling. If that is you, I want you to lift up your hands all over this place so that you can receive the anointing of God for the work that is before you. And I'm going to ask you to find the courage and the strength. Get out of your seat and come up here to the altar so we can lay hands on you so that we can pray with you so that we can encourage you when you walk up here walk out with your head up come on don't let shame and guilt put you down i tell you that god is going to breathe life into you he's going to give you abundance he's going to give you joy he's going to renew your passion there is purpose in you there is purpose for your pain there is purpose for your suffering there is purpose in your life the devil is a liar for every person that is standing in their chairs I need you to lift up your hands in this place I need you to open up your mouth this is called spiritual warfare we're coming against those that are struggling and in affliction we are the Silas to the Paul and the Paul to the Silas let's begin to pray it's gone in the middle of a storm come on let's begin to invite the glory of God to fall upon us let there be a cloud of his anointed let there be a cloud of his presence let there be a cloud of his holiness let's go in go ahead Edith take us in
more than I'm after. Yes, it's my joy to live surrendered. It's my joy to live surrendered. It's my joy. You're all that I'm after. 60 seconds. I need you to lift up your hands all over this place. Come on, let's go, new life. If you're up here at this altar, just lift up your hands. It is an act of surrenderance. Holy Spirit, fill us. I don't know what you need, but God is the God of I am. I'm trying to encourage somebody in this place that even in your chains, praise Him. I'm trying to encourage somebody in this place that even in your chains, worship Him. Oh, I need somebody to confuse the enemy right now. How is it possible that you're worshiping God when you should have lost your mind? How is it possible that you're worshiping God when you should have lost your life? How is it possible that you're worshiping God when grief has overwhelmed you? How is it possible that you're worshiping God when you've been overwhelmed with life? How is it possible that you're worshiping God when you've been operating in fear? But God is with you. Come on, I'll give you 30 more seconds. Praise Him in the storm. God is my joy. There is an assignment that is on your life. We got to roll up our sleeves because there's work to do. More people to get saved. But in this very moment, God, fill me. It's okay for you to be selfish right now. God, fill me. Fill my mind and fill my heart. You might have came here one way, but you're about to walk out different way. Receive the breath of God. Receive the anointing of God. He is with you. Pastor Rico is going to come up and he's going to lead you into the next steps. Receive it in Jesus' name. Beloved, for those of you who came up to make a decision about salvation, made a decision, the first call out for those making the decision about Christ, we want to pray with you and we want to guide you through the prayer, but you have to understand what's going on. We're not asking you to do something that we didn't all have to do. We all had to make this decision. When I gave my life to Christ, the first thing that I needed to do is, was I needed to confess. I needed to admit that I was a sinner. I needed to confess it. What does it mean that I was a sinner? Well, the DNA of sin is this, selfishness and disobedience. I had to confess, Lord, I admit that I was selfish and I was disobedient. And then I needed to believe. I needed to appropriate as truth the reality that Jesus came and died and rose again for me. That Jesus is the Son of God and that there's no other name given unto man by which we can be saved. I had to believe that. And finally, beloved, it's true for all of us. I had to accept it. I had to receive it. Look, I might have gifts for everybody, but you can choose to reject the gift. I had to consent to receive the gift of Jesus. Same thing for you. You have to consent to receive it. Everyone in hell is there because they did not consent to receive the truth about Jesus Christ. And for those of you who came up for your assignment, beloved, here it is. Your life is your assignment. Jesus told Peter, right? He told Peter this, to follow him. And he said, I will make you fisher, a fisher of men. It's the same way for all of us. Once you commit to follow Jesus, your life becomes the assignment. Amen. So, beloved, let's say, let's say this prayer together. Dear Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. I believe you came and died and rose again for my sins. You are my Savior. Finally, I accept Jesus Christ as my personal Lord. In Jesus' name.
Amen and amen. Welcome to the first day of the rest of your life. Enjoy. Beloved, I'm going to ask you if you would be still before we close you out. Pastor David has been talking about joy. And let me tell you this about joy. The Bible says about Jesus that for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. So we have that joy that's ahead of us. The Bible, and Pastor D taught us, says we can rejoice. Rejoice always. I say rejoice. We can go back to joy and back to joy and back to joy. And finally, it says this, that joy comes in the morning. Beloved, there should never be a day in your life that you don't have the joy of the Lord in you. Morning, during, and ahead of us. How many would say amen? For those of you who gave your life to Christ, how about a hand praise for the Lord? If you made a decision for Christ, we have the QR code. That's a way that we can connect with you. I have one final announcement, and then we'll send everybody home. Amen. Some of us are hungry. Amen. Jumpstart tickets for new lifers are on sale today in the lobby. Make sure you visit the table to register. The cost is $25 for the day sessions, and the night sessions are free. We're asked that you pay with credit card. Again, we started the day like this. Welcome and thank you. Welcome and thank you. Receive the blessing, beloved. May the Lord bless you and keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon you. And may the Lord be gracious unto you. And may the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace throughout this week. And the people of God say, go with God. Go in peace.